Vermont passed Act 128 and set out the goals for system reform, not just provide health insurance, but to, to deal with the total problem. President Obama's Affordable Care Act only dealt with the insurance, insuring people. It does not deal with cost escalation, or it does not deal with, let's say, quality of health care. You have higher ambition. <laughs> and and the, that, I make a confession. I was really why decide to be engaged with Vermont is because I really think you have a noble vision. And I don't find that among many states and among the people. <laughs> Indeed, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I'm particularly impressed that this is a Friday evening and so many of you will sacrifice your TGIF cocktail hour <laughs> to be here. So I particularly feel honored. And, uh, and also I'm impressed that after this uh, catastrophe from Hurricane Irene, that so many of you are still pu so publicly spirited and you still would be concerned about the health care uh, rather than how to rebuild the houses and the roads and stores in Vermont. The dean already introduced me as an economist. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what is an economist? <laughs> Besides, we have horns. <laughs> I give you a simple definition of a male economist. He's someone who has a thousand theories as how to make love, but have never met a girl. <laughs> I would like to put in a disclaimer from the beginning by saying uh, I came to Vermont, I met the girl uh, before I started the work. And so the, uh, what I'd like to do today, uh, this evening, is uh, really cover two topics because the Kate who was the one who in invited me, and uh, she gave me the topic, which is the how a single payer affects the vitality of Vermont. And I thought to myself, my gosh, I have to really do go back to square one and do some homework. And so I thought it's necessary for me to really first to explain how health and health insurance really affects the vitality of Vermont or a nation. And I would like to at least put that context in place first. Then go into talk about how the single payer may impact what we have recommended, that how that will impact Vermont. You can see I'm technology challenged. <laughs> this will now obey my command. <laughs> uh, okay. I would like to just uh, actually start with a list to impress you that we, can, we know through research that health has at least four major impacts on the economy and on the welfare of the people. That's the top four. And we also know 
health insurance and health care costs have at least two major impacts on the people and on the economy. And I will elaborate some of them in greater detail, but right now this is a long list and I will not uh, bore you by going through the details. But I would just like to say that health insurance does affect people's health. The latest one is done in Oregon. Oregon actually just had an experiment. They were going to expand their Medicaid program, but they did not have enough to cover everyone who are eligible for Medicaid. So they randomly selected who is going to be covered, who is not going to be covered. This allowed us the researchers, then we have a random trial experiment here. We can evaluate the ones who got randomly got the health insurance. How did that impact on their health? And also, how did that affect their employment? And papers are coming out. And I, this is done by a colleague of mine. And I can give you a preview. They found significant impact once the Medicaid, these Medicaid population got health insurance. It really have measurable impact on their health, as well as affect their ability to work. <coughs> So this issue where the health insurance really impact on people's health as well as their ability to work, I think it's going to be put in rest, to rest very soon. I will show you some evidence how health impacts on children's development and learning. I don't think that it's rocket science. You can use your imagination and logic to deduce that. And health affects workers' ability to work, what kind type of work, and how long to work. Again, I think that's just a simple logic. But let me tell you, in the academic world, this is debated for 50 years. <laughs> and that's how we like to keep ourselves employed. <laughs> And this other one is infant mortality actually affects actually people's uh, expectation how many children they should have. And uh, that changed the fertility rate. The change in the fertility rate changed, of course, the demographic patterns. And I just want to mention here quickly that you probably have heard this term, what we call demographic dividend. In, today in this world, China benefit a great deal from the demographic dividend. That's why Chinese economy has been able to grow so rapidly. That's one of the major reasons. We expect India to grow in the coming two decades because of that. We expect African countries, if they can lower their fertility rate, to grow like that. So this is a major discovery that, and I will not, that will be a separate presentation by itself if you want to go into depth about it. But I just want you to alert you, this has a significant impact on total economic growth of a nation or a state. The health care costs affects how many workers are employed, what wages they will receive. I will elaborate a little bit later. And so it's the last one, health care costs, uh, how that affects the state government and, and as well as the employers and workers. I am going to just uh, come to this side. 
I just want to s elaborate slightly more about how health affects human development. That's what we call the cap capability of a human being, both physically and mentally. And I think, again, uh, there's a whole body of literature on that. And, uh, you, uh, and uh, of course, it's obvious health may affect the learning, people's ability to learn. Just say the obvious, if a child is not well, the child may be absent quite frequent from school. And also, if you are weak and you are in pain, you probably cannot concentrate. So all these are, can be documented. And I will show you some evidence of that. Because in my work, these are all theories or concepts. And we're always trying to measure it to really sh sh make sure the theory is correct and then this ability to work. Let me just uh, present to you uh, some summary of literature that came in the past 15 years. And the a group of researchers from Princeton University look at the chronic people with chronic children with chronic condition with digestive and pulmonary functions. And then they look at if they had this chronic condition at age seven, how that impact on their test scores when they are 16. England test all the students on 11 subjects at age 16. And depending on whether you pass the test or not, that determines you can go on to college and or A, uh, <coughs> grade, uh, A level studies. And they found if a child at the age, up to age seven had chronic conditions, their test score, that means nine years later is, is, at, is 0 0.3 level lower. And that's a significant amount because the average test score out of the 11, usually the students only pass three. So this is a 10% decrease because they had these chronic conditions when they were young. But if they had a chronic condition up to age 16, you can see the test score is 0.5 lower. That means 20% lower than their peer groups who did not have that condition. Then they follow this group of students and see what's their lifetime earnings. And it's a 4% reduction in the probability they will be employed at the age 33. They drop 4% of them, in other words, on average drop out of the labor force, or they could not be employed for whatever reason. Then there are studies looking at low birth weight. By the way, all of these studies are done for high-income countries. They are done for in the United States with U.S. data or Canadian data or French data. A 10% increase in birth weight leads to 1% increase in the probability of graduating from high school. And this actually came from U.S. studies. And we thought the United States would not be, Americans would not be affected. But then this, statistically, this was robust. But what's interesting to me is a one pound increase in birth weight. If the baby is born under five pounds, is linked to a correlated with 7% increase in adult earnings. 
So if you are low birth weight and if you are, have a one pound more birth weight, one pound heavier at birth, you, are, you can expect a lifetime earning 7% higher. Those birth weights under five and a half pounds in the United States actually earns 12% less over their lifetime. So this tells you how important is the maternal child health care. And also education of the mother, how the mother should work, pay attention to nutrition and also their own health. So, so health has a lifetime imp impact. The, then let's look at the health and the employment. And uh, here let me look at some evidence. People with diabetic conditions, I'm sure you know this is the emerging problem in the United States. That's obesity. And uh, the CDC predict by year 2030, less than 20 years, one out of four Americans will, ha be, will have, be, have diabetic conditions. Right now, we have 7%. And it would, this would more than triple. This is a, that's why some people call diabetics or obesity is a pandemic problem. And the world is turning its attention to this problem because this problem is not isolated to the United States. This is a problem in Europe. This is a problem even in emerging countries like China and uh, Brazil and uh, uh, Chile. <clears throat> People with the diabetic complications, they earning $7,000 less, $8,000 less every year. That's 20% less than the average income of Americans. <clears throat> and then their total earnings is 29% over their lifetime compared to people with the same education, same family background because these studies control all the other confounding variables. <clears throat> and then also they found people with diabetic complications, they have, they're in the labor force 1.1 year less than others. <clears throat> I don't need to bore you with citing all the data. We actually study how arthritis affect people's employment earnings and that they work 20 to 35 percent fewer hours if you have arthritis and their earnings is 31 to 37 percent lower depending on the severity <laughs> of the arthritis and for asthma, bronchitis, or emphysema, the earnings of these people are 28.7% less. So the health condition of the individuals, which partly depending on health care or your access to health care or to prevention, you can see it has a significant impact on their ability to be productive or to be employed. So <clears throat> let's turn our attention then to health insurance. How does health insurance impact on the economy or the people? Health insurance, as I started out saying, the latest study shows health insurance give insured better access to health care and improve their health status. That means, based on the prior evidence I just showed you, you can deduce, that means they can participate in the labor force more actively. They can be employed.
We also found that the employment-based health insurance reduced labor mobility. This is what Vermont has now. This is what United States has now. By the way, United States is the exception in the world among the high-income countries. No other high-income countries condition your, your eligibility for health insurance based on your employment. Studies after studies shows health insurance lock you in a job. Because if you worry about, I want to move from this job to the next job, one, usually there's a waiting period for your health insurance. And two, maybe the other job has, doesn't have such a good coverage. It really impacts on the Americans, the efficiency of American macroeconomy. And this is proven by literally hundreds of studies, but we can't seem to move away from it. We're addic addicted to it. And do the employers really pay the premium when health insurance companies, let's say, increase the premium by 10%? The evidence is no. They pass that on to the, the cost to the employee and actually give employees lower cash wage increase. This is what we call shifting the burden backward. So the lower wage in America partly is due to because the reason is our health care cost, which is reflected in our health insurance, is so high, so the cash wage of our workers are relatively low. And I will show you a few minutes later how that impacts on the whole economy. Say this simply, is if I have less cash to go to a theater or go to a movies, or to, to buy clothing, then there, there's less demand. Then there's less production. There's less demand for labor. There's, there's a whole chain reaction here. So I hope I at least got you interested to say, oh, wow, there are quite a few impacts to this little thing called health or health insurance. Well, insurance can also impact directly on employment in a particular sector. This article just came out 10 days ago in New England Journal of Medicine. It's using Massachusetts data when Massachusetts introduced the connector that is uh, require individuals to buy health insurance, and if you have low, if your income is low, you are subsidized. That was introduced in two, in uh, beginning of two thousand seven, and you see the employment in health clearly bent upward. And there's a simple reason for it. If you have, if people who are uninsured before or underinsured, now they have health insurance, they're going to demand health care. That means more doctors may be drawn into the workforce. More, maybe nurses will be employed. And the more te technologists will be employed. So this is the latest piece of information, empirical information, just came out 10 days ago. It surprised us. We did not think it would be so visible that I can actually show on graph. I thought there would be some statistics 
shows a blip. But when you plot it out, it's so clear how these two are correlated. So besides the impact on employment, on people's ability, on capabilities, and earnings, and so forth, then what else does health impact? Let me go to the last point first. Because I do most of my work nowadays in other countries. I gave up on the United States since <laughs> 1994. I did not think any research I can do can contribute to American policy debate. Because American becomes so pol political sized and uh, it's uh, more ideology and beliefs drives the political decisions. And so I, I turn my, all my attention since mid 1990s to other countries except then Vermont drew me back in. <laughs> yeah, the Soviet Republic of Vermont. <laughs> I can give you a personal testimony that today there are about 40 nations in the world are trying to reform their health system in a fundamental way. I listed some of the large countries because if you count these several countries, they make up 45% of the population in the world. Why do they go through, want to go through fundamental reforms of their health systems? That's because Politically, people are dissatisfied, unhappy, and demand the political leaders to do something. Not through the market, because they gave up on the economic market. So they turn to this other market, which we call, which is a political market, where everyone has an equal vote. In the economic market, the more money you have, the more votes you have. <laughs> so people then turn to the political market when they think a system is unfair or they are being denied something that's really valuable to them. Even in an authoritarian state like China, the protests in the villages and in the, among the migrant workers forces the polar bureau members in China put this as a top priority. India as a democracy, that's even more so. Both countries admit politically they become unstable because they did not structure their healthcare system properly. This threatens the whole country's political stability. Well, I think the United States actually gave evidence to that. We let the problem go so long, we created such a powerful stakeholders in America, now, when President Obama comes in and trying to push through the affordable care, you see what kind of emotion it aroused, how much money get pumped into the campaigns, and creating, partly creating the political situation we have now. And we are now fighting through the courts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Other countries are learning from this. They don't want to let it go that far. And they're reallocating their resources. They are, they are reorganizing their healthcare delivery systems 
in a fundamental way which we will not even think of. And they change the medical, medical education to be team-based medical education, not hierarchical where the physician is a dominant force. Actually, the physicians have to work with nurse practitioners, with, uh, with the uh, social workers, and so, so forth. That's a new model even in medical education. We hardly discuss that in the United States. But the other countries are walking ahead of us. I just want to let you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> let me then uh, move on to then what are the major problems confronting Vermont? Here I try to, I hope I offer some conceptual ideas as was well evidence why health and health insurance is important in our social and economic fabric and for our well-being as well as our earnings and uh, our political stability. Vermont So legislature, in its wisdom, actually made these diagnoses. So if this is not my work. And then subsequently passed the Act 128 to commission a study, which I was fortunate to win a competitive bid. First, I think it's evident that not all Vermonters have health insurance. Even after Affordable Care Act, 32,000 Vermonters, 5% of your residents, will not have health insurance, even after the Affordable Care Act, if it's implemented, if it survives the core challenge. So 5% of your residents will still have to go without health insurance. And then roughly 15, 17 percent of the Vermonters have really shallow insurance, health insurance. So roughly 20 percent of Vermonters will still have trouble to get the financial access, the financial ability to gain health care. Second is the health care cost becomes so high that everyone complains it's not affordable. Workers, employers, the state, these are major players. When we interview them, we, to do the work for Vermont, we interviewed 140 people. From every spectrum of the life in Vermont, everyone's first concern is, I can't afford it, the health care cost. And I will show you a diagram why that is so. And another problem in Vermont is you have a fragmented health care delivery system. Doctors have their own office. Community <coughs> hospitals operate on their own. Your medical centers operate on their own. And the nursing homes operate on its own. Medical homes trying to integrate some, but uh, that's still at the early stage. So consequently, there's a lot of duplication of services. And there's a lot of gaps in communication about what is, wh what's the, the, what drugs, for example, is taken by that pa patient. So the other physicians will know what kind of co other drugs may create toxicity uh, problems for the patient. Then the efficiency. 
high administrative cost and uh, duplication of waste. These problems were diagnosed by yourself, by you, the community, as well as by your leaders. And this is just a graph show you what was going on in Vermont. Healthcare costs as a percentage of state, gross state pr product, that means the total economic production of your state. 11 years ago, it took up 12.9% of the total economic productivity. 2004 is 15.5%. 2009 is 18.5. Now it's reaching close to 20%. So in other words, every one out of five dollar of your economic production goes into health, spending on health care. That means you have less for education, less for environment, less for roads, less for trying to bring new industry into Vermont by subsidizing them. This graph simply illustrates the kind of pressure you're in. So so what happens then is that <clears throat> Vermont passed Act 128 and set out the goals for system reform, not just provide health insurance, but to, to deal with the total problem. President Obama's Affordable Care Act only dealt with the insurance, insuring people. It does not deal with cost escalation or does not deal with, let's say, quality of health care. You have higher ambition. <laughs> and and the, that, I make a confession. I was really why I decided to be engaged with Vermont is because I really think you have a noble vision. And I don't find that in, among many states and among the people. And so it's really a pleasure for me, an honor to be engaged in this uh, exercise we went, uh, we did. Uh. You want universal coverage and equitably finance. This reflects your ethics, your social ethics. You worry about equity. Most American states do not worry about equity yet. They do not consider the fairness. Do I worry about my neighbor? Do they have health insurance? And, and I will help to pay for part of it if I'm wealthy. Put out these simple statements really reflect, I call the social values of a society. And you have it. And I'm not trying to flatter you. If you don't have it, like in other countries, I bluntly say it publicly, and I say it to the prime minister. <laughs> not dead yet. And no, to me, as an academic, if an academic, particularly from another country or out of the state, cannot tell you the truth, then who can? <laughs> to me, that's. That's the privilege of an academic, as well as really the social responsibility of an academic. Sorry, I'm getting into a personal thing. <laughs> but I hope the graduate students, you have some sense of your professional integrity and your professional mission. What do you want to do with your life? And and what role you want to play to make the society a little bit better. So Vermont says, I want to ha give everybody health insurance coverage for all the essential or comprehensive services, but equitably funded. Second is, you want to change your health care delivery to be patient-centered. 
and the coordinated, that means integration. That will make doctors unhappy. <laughs> For some doctors, not all doctors, I should qualify that. And you want to integrate primary care prevention, health promotion together to acute services. And you want to reduce the waste and improve the quality of care. A major challenge is you want to contain the cost inflation, what we call bending the cost curve. But last but not least, your Act 128 specify the public has to be engaged. That's why I'm happy to be here tonight, this evening, to talk to you. Because you are the public, and you ought to be engaged, and you ought to hold your public officials accountable. And also what we have done or what they are passing through legislation should be transparent because you are the voters, and it is your tax money as well as your welfare on the line. This set of principles goals was set down in your Act 128. Let me just take one minute. How will you go from what you have to this? In other words, how do you go from here to there? The direction is set. The vision is there. Well, that's what your state commissioned us to do. And what we did is we really started out with a preconceived conclusion. I'm not a supporter, I, I, I do not necessarily believe there is one magic bullet that can solve the pr problem for every state or every country. So you have to examine the condition on the ground. For example, the political context. You have a political system is based on the community involvement. You have a long history of town meetings, and decisions are made in the towns. That's quite unique. And your voice can be heard. And I talk to many state legislators, and they tell me how much it can be easily pigeonholed by the voters. And that's very unusual. So we s examine, we look at the different alternative options before we, I, we decide on what might be the, the best two or three options. So I do not want to leave you with the impression we came in and we say, we know single payer is the best way. If you look at my work for other countries, you see some for some countries I designed single payer and others I did not, because I did not think politically was viable. So <clears throat> what is a single payer then? You heard this term a great deal. Uh, so let me offer a simple definition. It's providing insurance to every resident with a common benefit package. A common benefit package. And every resident. That implies decouple from employment. because many people are not employed. Or they may be employed by low-paying low, low paying, uh, um, 
uh, I'm sorry, firms, and the firms will not supply that insurance. <coughs> that's a huge change, and that's right now is one of your major battles in Vermont. Your big employers like to opt out the single payer. Mm -hmm. It's the wealthy and big companies in Vermont says, thank you, but no thank you, I'm doing fine. So this is something very fundamental in a single payer is everyone has the same basic benefit package. Second is channel all the payments, payments to physicians, to hospitals, to pharmacies, all through one single pipe. And I will explain to you why that matters. By the way, these are what we learn around the world. We, we study these other country systems, see what, how it works, or what advantages it has, or what disadvantage it has. And I will explain to you in a minute why the single pipe is so important. So single pair then have these two major features, and that's the way my team uh, defined the single pair. Others will give you an, an other definitions, like some other groups will say, this system has to be government run. You know this, that's not in my definition. So I want to just to be very honest and for, uh, to say this is uh, my team's definition. So what is <coughs> Green Mountain Care then? That's what we propose and then the governor and the legislature then put a name on it, which is much more attractive than what we can come up with. Uh, is universal coverage, every resident covered? You will bend the cost curve. That is, control the healthcare cost inflation, which I show the diagram is taking a larger and larger share of your total state's economic production. And also change the delivery system, establish a community based preventive and primary care. And as a first step, then move to an integrated delivery system. So by now you should, you should be asking, how can you produce that magic? <laughs> I'm not a physician, and if you read some of the blogs or the, some of the websites in Vermont, uh, people, there's one website the first declaration is Dr. Xiao is not a true, true doctor. Uh, which is true, I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> and that was the big bold letters. This was <laughs> I call myself is a system doctor. I deal with systems as a whole, not just only in pieces. In other words, if you think of about the car, I'm an automotive engineer. I'm not a person specialized only in brakes or steering wheels or tires or transmissions. I look at that car as a total functional body and I have different parts and they have to come together. So we did systemic reform. We recommend a systemic reform, I should say. You change the financing system for multiple payers, that's many insurance funds or patient self-pay to a single pay payer to reduce administrative cost. And I will show you how much you can reduce in a few minutes. 
reduce fraud by creating a comprehensive profile with single pipe payment. This is where single pipe comes in. Countries after countries, we found, when you have multiple payers paying doctors, pharmacies, and hospitals, this gives the opportunity and space for some doctors who want to do it or some hospital or pharmacy to cheat. To take advantage, there are many pairs, so I gouge you, I overprescribe something, or I charge you higher fees. No one has a complete picture of that provide, what that provider is doing. Once, if you have a complete picture of this practice or this clinic or this hospital is doing, you actually can easily identify which one is abusing the system or which one is committing fraud. One of the biggest problems in Texas, why Texas Medicare cost is one of the highest, is because home, home care committing a great deal of fraud in Texas. But no one has a total picture because Medicaid doesn't share data with Medicare. Private insurance certainly don't share data with them. So nobody knows what does that home care organization really doing? What's their revenue? And if they only employ 20 people, how many homes can they take care of? But if you look at but if the data is scattered, you don't get a complete picture. This is where a single pipe comes into play that allow you to identify who is a good provider. You leave them alone. You do not burden them with paperwork, monitoring them, and scrutinize them so closely. You identify that what we call is roughly 8%. We discover in most high income countries that 8% to 10% of the providers will abuse the system. And in the extreme case, they will commit fraud. You pay attention to, on that. You leave the good doctors alone. You leave the good hospitals with good management alone. FBI has a public report estimating the medical fraud in the United States totals close to 8 to 10 percent of the medical cost. It's not minuscule. 8 to 10 percent. We're trying all sorts of ways to try to control that. At least I do not know what's a better way than controlling it through a single pair that build up the complete profile. In Taiwan, where they adopt that, the first year, they were able to actually reduce the cost close to 10% just by go after the fraud and the abuse just in one year, once they had the data system in place. Then the other one is reform medical malpractice system, which I think all the sensible people agree we need to do that. And I will even add not only sensible or reasonable people would agree to that, but we have people who are strongly opposed to that because their own pocketbook is affected. And the question is then, does, does the leaders, political leaders, willing to pay some political capital for that? And we recommended that they adopt a system used in New Zealand because our work is we examine the, the, the systems throughout the world and trying to identify what's the best ones 
then we try to adapt into a country or state. Changing the incentive structure. I think what George Bernard Shaw once wrote, can you imagine that you pay the surgeons for every organ he can cut, cut out of you? <laughs> That's the system we have, fee-for-service. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have physicians who are really, many of them are really constrained by professional ethics. But some of them are professional ethics pretty low. <laughs> I can tell you what happens in China. China, actually, the doctors will prescribe for flu or prescribe three antibiotics. Then, then also give you IV injections or cortisol to knock the, down your fever. Do they know that's really bad medicine? Yes, they do. But they're paid on a fee-for-service basis. And they, their medical ethic constraint is much erode it. So they would, they do not think how much harm they are doing to the patients. But I should not pick on China. <laughs> I, I gave you one study by Mark Ch Chason. This was done 25 years ago. Reviewing medical record for patients who had con coronary artery bypass surgery. At that time, that surgery have a surgical mortality of 4%. So four out of 100 patients die at the surgical suite or soon after that. He found 23% of patients with coronary artery bypass surgeries was medically contraindicated. 23%. He found another 25% is highly questionable. Only half the patients who had <coughs> coronary artery bypass surgery was really medically called for and is appropriate. Why, you have to ask. That's because we train too many specialists in America. <coughs> If you're trained, only know how to use a hammer, then everything becomes a nail. <laughs> this is the situation in America. This is what we technically call induced demand. <coughs> That's promoted by the incentive structure we give them. If you do this, you get paid, and you can often get paid very, very well if it's a surgical procedure. So we, we propose to change the incentive. How you pay the doctors based on capitation and the global budget hospitals pay the hospital on a global budget rather than for every item they do, they charge you for it. Then through the change in the benefit package, then we try to, uh, to make shift the patient's demand to lower level for prim to primary care rather than people trying to seek specialist care. And also finance medical homes, preventions, and s so forth. As well as uh, employers' uh, programs to change their employees' lifestyles. I'm sorry I'm running out uh, over time. Let me just then I'll give you the, some of the overall impacts. I think some of you, we, 
what we relied on a simulation model to see what the impact of this. <coughs> and by if Vermont adopt all these changes, you could reduce your health care costs by 25 percent. You can remove the administrative cost, which is for insurance co companies. That will reduce 4.1 percent. And you can reduce administrative hassles on physicians and hospitals because they have to do so much paperwork to satisfy so many different insurance plans. That will save the physicians and hospitals 3.7 percent. Fraud and abuse. We did not take the full credit. We said we think if you have the single pair, you can reduce that by 4.5%. Maybe there's even more in that, but we did not want to claim it. Integrated delivery system, we say you can reduce the health care cost by 10%. But your neighbor in Dartmouth Medical College, the experts there, claim you can reduce by 25 percent. Uh, again, we were trying to be conservative. So we will not be charged. We're trying to oversell something. And the uh, medical practice is 2 percent and uh, so forth. But I just want to say there's a huge amount of savings can be gotten. And this graph shows if there's no reform, your health care costs we project this per person basis from close to $8,000 per person in Vermont. In 14 years, you will go up to 12500 This is adjusted for inflation, so this is on constant dollars. What we propose to do, like, take out fraud and abuse, and that would produce a one-time drop. That's, that's one-time drop in the cost. And then this slope of this line, you, I hope you can see, is less than this. It's lower. This is a bend in the cost curve. So potentially, this is amount of savings. That's what this this graph gives you. This is a breakdown in absolute dollars. This is estimation that after President Obama's affordable care is implemented, what additional amount can you save through a single payer system if you implement it step by step? Just by the first year, the step, we estimate you can save $550 million for Vermont. And then five years later, you could save $1.1 billion. Vermont has a total economic production state capacity about roughly $15 billion right now. These are significant savings, but you won't have to use the savings to insure the people who are not insured or underinsured. So you have to spend that money. You have to maybe rebuild some of your community hospitals. You have to recruit more primary care doctors. You have to build up your medical homes. So you have to spend money to save the money. So it's not net savings. But they also, we showed to finance this how much the employer, if they pay 75 percent, employee pays 25 percent, what would be their payroll tax rate? Without the change, we estimate that year, employer will be paying 12 percent higher, and employees will pay about 4.3, 4.4%. So they will pay less. 
and then you see the rates will drop because this is reform is a phasing. We're not we're not arguing you can do it with a big bang. Okay. So the question we will ask: How does this affect employment in Vermont? We had to rely on another established, well-established micro simulation model to do the work. And the model shows in the first year, actually, that will create 3,800 new jobs. And that would decline because the because when you shift into integrated delivery system, then you need fewer um, you remove the duplication and waste, and that will reduce the uh, number of people. But you still a net gain of 2,900. Impact on gross state product is $110 million. And what I left out on this graph is we estimate that in the first year, there will be 1,500 people migrating to Vermont because the wages in the state will be rising because the health care costs reduced, so that money will be paid out as higher, uh, higher wages. And also, there will be demand for workers. And that number of people mi mi migrate into Vermont in 2019 it was 2,500. So this is what we can quantify. I'm not saying this is precise science, but this is the best, you might say, educated estimation. And it could be wrong, we said in our report, could be wrong by plus minus 10, 15 percent. And actually some of your legislatures and, or the opponents cease upon that. Say so that, how can we trust the rest of the report? <laughs> and, uh, but it's up to you to judge that. Let me say who will benefit. I think it's obvious who will benefit. The un uninsured, underinsured, and uh, employers and workers will pay less. Most primary care doctor, physicians, and practitioners will receive more net income. But then I show you who will bear the burden. If everybody gains, then this is an easy solution. Yeah. <laughs> Private insurance organizations, and especially those outside of Vermont. So you're in a favorable position. You have one dominant insurer, and Others are out of state, so you, as a state, you will not be hurting as much as if it's, this is done in New York. The, in particular, the sales, marketing, underwriting personnel of the insurance companies will lose their jobs. Staff employed by hospital and clinics to do the billing claims will do, lose their jobs. So therefore, you need some kind of retraining program to help, the, help these people to make a transition. Employers who do not offer insurance or shallow health insurance now have to pay more. Last but not least, probably cover most of you in this room, is right now, the two high earners in a single household because you will be taxed. Both of you working, you will be paying a percentage of your payroll. Right now, the system works this way. If you have health insurance from your employment, your wife is working, you can say to your wife, don't sign up for health insurance. You get it just from, so then you only pay w just for yourself. So the high income to earn the families will be hurt. Let me end, boy. 
uh, I don't think I need to summarize this. Uh, this is slides just summarize this, and let me just go to. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Peace. Thank you, Dr. Shao.